is Professor Priya Mahadevan from SN Bose, and she is going to tell us about when and why do we have unconventional behavior in Van der Waals materials. Yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, the Indian, Indian Academy of Science, for organizing this special symposium, and also Manish for the invitation to present some of the recent work which we've been doing in this area. So what I'm going to talk about is our, uh, these unconventional behavior in Van der Waals bilayers. And um, so let me try to take you through what exactly I mean by that. So the ones, the Van der Waals bilayers that I'm going to be focusing on are the transition metal dichalcogenites. So to give you a glimpse of what exactly they, uh, these structures involve, I'm going to take an example of molybdenum diselenite. And if I look at it from the top, what I have is a hexagonal lattice, which, seems to, which has these molybdenum atoms, which are purple over here, as well as the selenium atoms arranged like this. And if I take a side view, which I show over here, uh, what I see is that you have a center. It's not exactly a flat surface that I have over here in these materials. I have a central molybdenum layer and a layer of these anions, which is selenium over here, and a layer of the anion selenium below. So this is what comprises of one monolayer. And within this layer, the interactions are very strong. However, what one has is, if you, have, if you, put, you, you look at these structures, if you have, when you have one more layer, the interaction is very weak and is Van der Waals type. So what happens is you can just take a piece of scotch tape and put it on this layer, on these layers, pull it out, and you can pull out one or more layers at a time. So if I can manage to pull out one layer every time, what I can do is make my own Lego structures and I can construct these heterostructures. And the interest is that what people have done is that, you know, you, you've taken just, let's stick to two layers for the moment. And so you have the first layer, and you rotate the second layer with respect to the, the bottom layer with res by an angle of theta, okay? And now the question is, well, you have these very weakly coupled objects, and suddenly the question, uh, the question everyone is asking in the community is, why are we seeing very new physics in these materials when the coupling between them is so weak? So what exactly is happening over here? To give you a glimpse of some of the experiments which have really driven the field. So for instance, I'm, uh, this is another of the, from this same category of materials. So what you see is you have, this material is a semiconductor, and you just think of it that you're moving your Fermi level into the valence band. And you, that's what you're doing over here. You're doping holes, so you're moving your Fermi level, which was like so earlier, without doping, you had it as a semiconductor. Moving it into the valence band, you have metallic behavior, and suddenly it again becomes insulating, okay? And some of, at some angles also, you see superconductivity, which was recently seen by this group, uh, Ken Fai Mark's group at Cornell. And the question is, why are these boring semiconductors, which we've known for a very long time, showing all these exotic properties? So before we try to, uh, you know, let's try to put this together and let's try to see what we know already about these materials. So this is what I showed you earlier. So each of these molybdenum atoms over here has a, um, has these six selenium atoms around it and it these selenium atoms form a particular crystal field which actually lifts the degeneracy of the d orbitals. So instead of your five d orbitals being degenerate, what you have is this particular ordering of the d orbitals on the on this in this compound. So what happens is now if you just did a formal you know text, uh, high school valency count, you can see that molybdenum should have two d electrons associated with it, and so these two d electrons are believed to occupy this level. These levels are unoccupied, and so what you have is a semiconductor by this very naive ideas. However, all along we we known them to be semiconductors. We believe this to be the picture of why they are semiconducting. However, you just look at the character, do some simple analysis, which, we, which is what we've done. You can, I mean, so essentially what I'm showing you over here are the energies, and I've plotted it in a different way. For some of you, you may not have seen plots like this. It's just different, uh, it's, so what you need to follow, these are just the bands along various symmetry directions in my unit cell. And this is my, this is my highest, these are my highest occupied bands, and these are my lowest unoccupied bands. Indeed, I do get a semiconductor. But we've done something additional. What we've done is we've color coded the contribution uh, of these eigenfunctions to these, to these bands, just taking only these two con contributions, dz squared and dx squared minus y squared. And you see that it's not such a simple, simple picture that's been believed so far. And it's very interesting because you have, 
you know, over here you have the dz squared lower and the dx squared minus y squared higher, whereas you have an exact reversal and yet you have the semiconducting nature. Anyway, so let's first keep stick to the semiconducting nature and try to find out what exactly is happening in these systems. And uh, going, going back to another set of experiments, this is from the group of Abhay Pashupati. What, you, what he saw was, I mean, this is the picture based on which the phase diagram, which I showed earlier, was constructed, which is that if you didn't have, if you had a, a particular, this bilayer that we find naturally occurring, what you would have is you would have the semiconducting behavior. So what's shown over here is the resistivity as a function of hole concentration. So when your Fermi level is in my gap, you have the semiconducting nature. And as I'm doping carriers into my valence band, I have the metallic nature. However, at these different twist angles, which is you know, all the way from 5.1 to 4 that they've done, you see you have this peak, you have this you know, insulating char semiconducting character, you have this metallic nature, and suddenly there's, kind, there's a blip and there's an increase in the resistivity, which they associate with, a semi with again a transition from a metal metallic into a semiconducting region. So why do these materials show such unusual behavior? Because naively, you'd, you'd, uh, I mean, I'm moving my Fermi level into my valence band, and I wouldn't expect anything except, uh, you know, in these materials, I'd expect only semi, uh, you know, metallic transport. Another thing, the, the way this has been, uh, so one viewpoint that has existed so far is that, well, now, um, if I'm twisting this, what I have is I, I have very large unit cells realized, okay? And so as a result, what I would have is that the Brillouin zone or the Fourier space would be very, very small. And so what one belief that has existed is that essentially, because the Brillouin zone sizes are very small, I would have very dispersionless levels and that is responsible for the unusual behavior which I see over here. But well, we do know that they are, you know, that the coupling is very weak and we can you know, use a scotch tape and remove layer by layer. And so if this, there's a very weak interaction between the layers, that should also reflect itself in the electronic structure. So looking at that, what we did was, we just said, okay, let's take a monolayer, which is, and the energy bands for the monolayer are shown by these red dashed lines. And for the for a bilayer, which is without all these rotations in, an, you know, in a, a regular type of stacking, which I showed at the beginning, uh, the band structure is shown, the band energy bands are shown over here in the black lines. And what you can see is indeed it's what we expect. There is hardly any perturbation of the, you know, in some regions there's a strong perturbation, whereas mostly there is hardly any changes in the energy bands with respect uh, to the monolayer. So this indeed is exactly what we expect. So why are we seeing such different behavior? Okay, so what we did was to just to understand what the origin of the changes were, we mapped the ab initio band structure, the, I mean, the band structure which we calculated within the density functional theory for the monolayer as well as a bilayer. We mapped it onto a relevant type binding model. Okay, and so what we did was, uh, for both these cases, we have a good description. And then the next step what we did was, we said, okay, the only coupling which seems to exist between the two layers is because of, you know, um, interlayer hopping interactions. So let me just switch off that, which I can in a model. So I switched off the interlayer hopping interactions and superposed the band structure of the bilayer. So this is onto the monolayer and it's exact. So all the changes, even in, this, in these so-called Van der Waals materials, if you go back and look at the, you know, the distances between the layers, you're still talking about three point, you know, something like 3.6. And if your interlayer, you know, molybdenum, molybdenum distance or distances are typically 3.2, the interaction strength should not just vanish at 3.6. So there is still some small interlayer hopping interaction strength in these materials, which causes all these changes, which we are seeing uh, when we go from one layer to, to, and as we build the number of layers. Okay, so there are, so, so, so far what we've seen is that, okay, so sh the question is, uh, we see that there's a weak perturbation because of the presence of the next layer. So when we have these twisted structures with very large unit cells, should I just think of them as, you know, the untwisted limit and a weak perturbation? So that's the way we, we decided to approach the problem. Okay, so instead of taking, you know, the unperturbed Hamiltonian and adding on the terms, the way we went about it is slightly different. We took, we could solve it for the large 
for the large Moire cell. So we had the eigenfunctions. We projected those eigenfunctions onto the untwisted limit and tried to get a gauge of what is the extent of perturbation that's happening over here. Okay? So just to give you an idea why this is important, okay? So, um, so what you have is we've just I've just taken a material. This is the you know the small unit cell or the primitive cell. We've just you know repeated it 16 times. So we formed a supercell. And if I take the supercell, you know, Brillouin's own directions, this is the band structure. So you see that immediately I see a lot of flat bands, etc., emerging, which and there's no perturbation because I've just repeated it. Uh, you know, 16 times. And so what, I mean, essentially, by, do, by projecting these eigenfunctions onto this, uh, onto the primitive cell, we recover this. So essentially what you, what I want to emphasize is, of course, for a primitive supercell, you re recover the entire band structure of, I mean, uh, when you repeat it, you'll recover the entire band, band structure when you're doing a perfect supercell. But if there's a weak perturbation, this limit, this approach will also give us the, you know, the, uh, the unperturbed limit and the small changes as, uh, associated with that. In, because if you get, you know, only flat bands like this, one would get, one would think of very different physics happening over here because, uh, you know, it's dispersionless and so on. Okay. So we started out with a very large um, angle of rotation, which is 19.03. And the reason for that is because we wanted to show that it's not just, you know, large unit cells giving rise to unusual behavior. And this has a um, about uh, unit cell dimension about 51, uh, 50, 51.69 angstroms. Okay, so we started with this, and then what we did was okay. Suppose again, just to illustrate the point, uh, if I plotted the band structure for this super cell or the Moire cell that I have here, okay, um, what I see is along the Moire cell directions, you see flat dispersionless band. But if I carried out the projection that I was talking about, taking the eigenfunctions, putting it on the unperturbed limit, and this color coding represents the weight of, on, uh, of the unperturbed limit in each case. Um, and to give you a, as a comparison, I also give you the band structure of the untwisted limit in green. What you can see is that essentially we seem to be recovering the untwisted limit band structure for these very large twist angles, which seems to suggest that there is hardly any perturbation at these large twist angles. So it's not just a large unit cell effect. And so when I go on to look at some small twist angles in the regime, which were of interest in the experiments, what you see is something more. When you look at this structure, what you see is that you seem to be seeing different types of you know, stackings. Here it seems to be a staggered type of stacking of the second layer on the first, whereas here it seems to be an atom on atom type of stacking. And so if I, um, it's just to give you an idea of what types, how the second layer could, there are various ways um, you could have the second layer sit on the first to small, have these very small unit cells associated with it. So these are the high symmetry stackings and not those, you know, the, uh, uh, the twist ang different twist angle structures which have large Moire cells that I'm talking about. So suppose you have these atoms sitting on top of each other because of the, as the distance between these two anions is about 3.8 angstroms, you'd expect uh, large steric repulsions between electrons on the two atoms. And as a result, the layers like to stay apart. And this is the uh, interlayer distance that you find in this case. Whereas when you have a staggered type of arrangement, the two layers can come closer. And each of these staggered types of arrangements, you have the interlayer separations of this order. Okay, so well, so what we did was we, uh, did the same analysis um, that, okay, before I, I mean, even in this, so when we took this Moire cell of uh, 3.48 and you, of twist angle 3.48 and did a relaxation, what you see is in these regions where you have a staggered type of stacking, the interlayer distances are, are smaller. It's about 3.2 angstroms. Whereas in this case where the interlayer, where it's an atom on atom stacking, the interlayer different distance is large. So you have instead, once you do the, you have some kind of a rippled sheet which emerges when in these, at these small twist angles. Okay. Again, we did the same analysis. The convention is the same. You have these dispersing bands uh, over here, but you have something else coming here, which is that you have a flat band, almost dispersionless, emerging above this highest occupied band at gamma, gamma, okay? So this now explains why we have the unusual physics in this regime, because now you dope into this band, 
and you can have you have a very flat band and you can have all the correlation physics existing in these materials and that is we believe is what is uh, uh, what is happening at this regime giving rise to the unusual physics over here okay what is the what why exactly do we have a flat band if i just kept the interlayer fix uh, separation fixed even then i do have a flat band emerging and uh, so what exactly what is the origin of it so essentially the interlayer you know uh, interlayer hopping interactions scale with the distance and so if i looked at the a profile of the interlayer distances i see that at 19.03 and at 3.48 you know uh, fixed interlayer separation which i just showed you i have i seem to have a very similar profile okay uh, so that means that it's not just the profile of inter these the num uh, this histogram profile of the interlayer distances which seems to be mattering there seems to be something more so what we did was we took a lyrell space profile of you know all the distances which are less than say about 3.8 angstroms where we expect in the interlayer coupling to be large and you see at 19.03 it's the profile gives us a very random uh, uh, you know a random distribution whereas at 3.48 you have regions where the interlayer couplings are stronger with more number of neighbors which seems to suggest that what happens because of this you know those patches forming is that you have regions where the interlayer coupling is very strong and the perturbation is much stronger in those regions so this we this is what is responsible for you know the flat band emerging out of of the gamma point if you remember it had the the top highest occupied band over there had the dz dz squared character so the two dz squared orbitals on the two transition metal sites interact with each other as a result of which you have this flat band separating out it's like some kind of uh, some regions which have these uh, stronger perturbations which lead to that and indeed you if you looked at the real space charge density you see that it's localized in some in some regions and not in over the entire uh, sorry this is the uh, charge density associated with this split off band the flat band that we see and it's localized in some part of the moire cell and not dist not over the entire cell okay so this has been ha what happens at the gamma point where you have significant interlayer hopping interactions however these materials also they have they have a high spin orbit interaction associated with them so what happens is what happens when you take those into account and so your your highest occupied band is no longer at gamma but it uh, it's at k now when you what happens over there is that your in plane orbitals are contributing over there and so you don't really have a very significant interlayer interactions should i also see flat band physics over there and that's the question we asked and we took the example which was at that by that time the experiments had come out uh, on the uh, tungsten diselenite and so we said let's you know examine what exactly is happening over here and took this angle in the you know the small angle range where we have these patches um so again the everything various details are similar however what we did was when we looked uh, we again did the same analysis of projecting the eigen functions Uh, on to the primitive cell eigen functions and the green lines over here are my untwisted limit band structure so what you see is well above gamma you do have these some flat bands emerging but we are not interested over th with them because we have um a highest occupied band is now at k and if you zoom in over here what you see is you have two two sets of bands which seem to be crossing each other let's try to reconstruct these bands and that's exactly what we did uh um, so what we did was we uh so one band if we followed through is localized entirely on one layer so a b and d are entirely localized on the lower layer with this uh, this being their contribution uh, it's about almost 100% on the lower layer whereas the band number c and as well as when you follow through to these points is entirely localized on the upper layer there was an unusual aspect about so this these are two bands which we find over here which seem to be flat and separated out from the remaining bands and there's an unusual aspect which i didn't uh, you know uh, which i didn't focus on before over here uh, of the electronic structure okay uh, which is that okay this was carried out at a twist angle of about 5.1 degrees and this is the phase diagram that i showed you which is that as your doping holes you have these low resistive states and then you have an insulator and then again low resistive states but all this this peak was prominent 
only in the presence of an electric field, which meant that the electronic structure was very strongly tunable by the electric field. So using the same magnitude of the electric field, we've used, uh, this is volts per nanometer, we've used volts per angstrom, so 0 0.04 volts per angstrom. So you can see that now, I why the electronic structure is so tunable, there's no coupling between the layers. Think of a two, two by two tried binding Hamiltonian, and the electric field is just introducing a staggered potential, and your coupling, the hopping, coupling between the layers is zero. So now, as I'm introducing the electric field, I am, you know, changing the on-site energies of one layer with respect to the other. And so I move this band entirely out. So I move it up and separate it from the lower band. And so what I have now, if I were to dope, if this was my starting electronic structure of this twisted structure, I'm here, I have a semiconductor. I'm here, I have a metal. I come in here, I have a, again, um, a semiconductor and so on. So basically this one electron picture seems to capture various aspects of these systems. Now going to the large, um, another large, the lar other large angle, which is 19.03, what I find over here is that uh, there is no, no interesting physics over here. There's no flat band formation and your uh, electronic structure is very similar to the untwisted limit electronic structure, okay? So then the question is, they, I mean, all that spinorbit did over here was suppose you had a set of degenerate levels, it split that degeneracy. Then if both these systems at both these angles have the similar sized Moiré cell, okay, what is response, and there's no coupling between the two layers, what exactly is responsible for the flat band formation? And the reason is that it's actually because the two layers, when you have these two layers, the, there is a, you know, the Moiré potential they encounter is very different. There is a register, I mean, the atoms which are sitting on top are, are different and they lead to a different Moiré potential in this case. So we would expect the scattering at the Brillouin zone boundaries to be similar because they have very similar unit cell sizes. However, when we did the analysis, we, saw, we found that the, you know, the, uh, so, uh, the scattering is happening not at the Moiré cell boundaries, but at the primitive cell boundaries, the Fourier components are largest for those, and therefore we need to consider only a scattering at the Brillouin zone boundaries of the pr primitive cell. To ex emphasize what I mean, I just have a, a two minutes, so I should be finishing in time. So at 19.03, you can think of these points, these are the, some of the energies which we have, and this black line over here is the, uh, you know, uh, is the low, uh, Brillouin zone of the lower layer, and the uh, red line is the prim um, Brillouin zone of the rotated, you know, both of for the primitive case. And so what happens is that they are far away from the, you know, the, 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 the perturbation is due to the zone boundary scattering happening at these corners. And since these points are far away, they ex experience a very weak perturbation. However, at three point, and so the band structure is similar. However, at 3.48, what you see is that all these points are very close. You can think of these points as close to the zone boundary over here. And so they get strongly scattered. And as a result of this, we have the flat band formation. So with that, I would like to conclude, okay. And uh, I'd just like to add that although this, what this paper said was it's at happening at half filling, that's what they conjectured. What happens is because of the zones, so because of the zone boundaries uh, scattering, the degeneracy is reduced to one, okay, uh, of the valence band maxima at K, and therefore this is actually, um, yeah, so there's only one band in this case. Okay, so essentially one electron physics, effective one, if, I mean field physics, seems to be capturing what's happening in these systems. And with that, I'd like to leave you with the conclusions, which is that it's essentially concentrated regions of enhanced perturbations which lead to your flat band formation in twisted bilayers of MOAC2 and in tung twisted tungsten diselenide, we find that it's actually the zone boundary scattering which is, res I mean, uh, which is responsible for the flat band formation. All this was work done by my uh, former graduate student, Sumanthi Patra, and was a part of her thesis and these are some of our published references. Thank you for your attention. You know, you have flat bands, so does it also mean that you are going to have several magnets because of the flat There band? are ex reports now of, uh, so the thing is, at this, uh, yeah, there is, there are reports of possible ferromagnetism also, yes, you can, yeah. But for that you are bringing the exchange. Exactly, so I mean, I'm saying, okay, my, I want to add one point that, 
a lot we have the starting point from the one electron picture from which we need to proceed to understand more aspects of the physics interesting talk uh, i just wanted uh, you had uh, in addition to the one electron picture you had also done uh, band structure using uh, dft right yes yes so effective one electron yes. so in that do you really see uh, a a variation in the uniformity of the layer is it really flat no so that's the so these are optimized within dft calculations uh, and you do see the you know the that uh, the layers coming closer so this so whereas you have a staggered type of stacking you do see the layers coming closer there we do find it in the so, ft uh, so the, the same layer uh, at some point it is closer and, yes. and, and so on yes yes and then tally with the uh, the band structure where you have found the extra interaction. yes 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 exactly uh, i wanted to ask you you know uh, we hadn't done this uh, level of analysis but uh, by layer uh, borophene okay have the same band structure as monolayer graphene okay so we were just looking at the uh, bilayer of the bilayer borophene okay uh, and uh, the behavior is uh, uh, is a little bit more complex but uh, seems to be similar still in okay. many ways okay thank you thank you okay if not let's thank the speaker once again <clears throat>